a defendant treated so maliciously and with so much content by the American court system. He said the Marcus Garvey case was a total farce. They set that man up and they lynched him in the courtroom because they didn't want him to continue with the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation because it would have economically liberated Africa, Black America, the Caribbean, Australia, Central and South America, Black Europe, and points beyond. And they lynched Garvey to destroy the Black Star. They lynched Garvey to destroy the Black Star Line. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. Garvey goes to jail to help raise money. Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey compiles his speeches and in quotes into this book, The Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. This was compiled by Queen Mother Amy J. Scott, his second wife. Him and Amy Ashwood got a divorce. He married Amy Jakes. I guess Marcus Garvey liked girls named Amy. Okay. And so, while he's in jail, they're raising money to appeal the decision. The Supreme Court refuses to hear Garvey's case. The Supreme Court refuses to hear Garvey's case. The Supreme Court refuses to hear Garvey's case. So Malcolm X's father, Earl Little. Malcolm X's father, Earl Little, writes to the President of the United States demanding that Garvey be pardoned for this unjust conviction and sentence. Other Garveyites write, there's a massive campaign by Garveyites around the world saying our leader was lynched. He was not given a fair trial. We demand a retrial. The whole Garvey thing was powerful, brothers and sisters. It was powerful. It was powerful. And I think that President Calvin Coolidge, President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, Finally decides, November 18th, 1927, Marcus Garvey goes to jail, 1925. At the end of 27, serving nearly three years, November the 18th of 1927, President Calvin Coolidge of the United States of America commutes Garvey's sentence. He is released from jail in Atlanta. He served at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. The Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is where Garvey did his three years in jail. The President of the United States commutes the sentence. I believe he was scared. I believe he was scared. He also knew Garvey was done wrong. He knew Garvey was convicted unjustifiably. But I think they were scared because Garveyites wasn't no cowards. Garveyites was unapologetically after this. Marcus Garvey's military Marcus Garvey's military, the Universal African Legion. There would be no Black Panther Party if there was no Universal African Legion. There would have been no Deacons for Defense if there was no Universal African Legion. There would be no Fruit of Islam if there was no Universal African Legion. Marcus Garvey gave us the first major national black militia in the Universal African Legion. And these brothers were serious. They were suited. They was booted. They went to war with the Klan. They went to war with the racists. They went to war with the police. Yes, brothers and sisters, the African guards of Garvey was nothing to fuck with. The African guards of Garvey was nothing to fuck with. They had guns, they had rifles, they drilled, they trained, they was ex-military, and they defended Garvey. In fact, the government was so scared when they first arrested Garvey. When they first arrested Garvey back in 22, 23, when they first arrested Garvey, they were afraid that the Universal African Legion, the Marcus Garvey military, 
They were so scared that the Universal African Legion, the Marcus Garvey's military, you good, Ops? The Marcus Garvey military was going to break into the prison and bust him out of jail when he was locked up in New York City. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. The Marcus Garvey military, which is the Universal African Legion, the African Guards of Garvey, were so intimidating that the government put extra security on Garvey. Extra security on Garvey because they was afraid that the Universal African Legion was going to break into the New York City jail and bust Garvey out. The same way the Black Liberation Army busted our sister, Asada Shakur, out of New Jersey prison and sent her to Cuba, which was the most thoroughly organized Marcus Garvey Island in the Caribbean. The African Guards of Garvey, which takes me to, which takes me to Marcus Garvey's meeting with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, y'all know why he started the Black Star Line to build international economic power for African people. Black producer, black distributor, black consumer. So we don't have to talk about Black Star Line. Y'all know there was an agent that infiltrated the Black Star Line, Captain Cock, Cockburn the Coon, who sabotaged the whole thing, but it was still successful for some time before that happened. But Garvey, on June the 25th, 1922, June the 25th, 1922, June the 25th, 1922, in Atlanta, Marcus Garvey meets with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Now I'm going to ask y'all a question. I want to see who's thinking. I want to see who's thinking. I want to see who's thinking. Yes, my Latino brothers and sisters, if they identify as African, we accept them. You saw all the chapters of the Garvey movement in Central and South America. Okay, you saw all the chapters. So I have no problem with Latinos who are proud to be black. If they're not proud to be black, I want nothing to do with them. So on June the 27th, June the 25th of 1922, Garvey meets with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Black leaders got mad at Garvey for meeting with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, let me ask you guys a question. I want to see who's thinking. I want to find out who's thinking tonight. I want to find out who's thinking the second night of Kwanzaa. Why did Garvey meet with the Ku Klux Klan? I'm going to give you all a little hint. Why did the Honorable Marcus Garvey, leader of the largest, most unapologetic black organization in the history of the world, why did he meet with the most racist white man of the most racist organization in America? Why did he do that? I'm going to give you a little hint. I'm going to give you a hint. I just told you. Marcus Garvey was the president general of the UNIA. He was the president general. You know what that means? He's in charge of the political and the military. He's in charge of the political and the military. President hyphen general. President General Marcus Garvey. That's his title. The African Guards of Garvey, the Universal African Legion, was at war with the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan and the Garvey military were at war with each other. They was killing us. We was killing them. Shootouts all the time in the South. Okay? So why do you think Garvey met with the Grand Wizard? Why does America meet with China? Why does America meet with China? 
Why did America meet with Fidel Castro? They don't like Fidel. Why did they meet with him when he was alive? Why? Why? You know why? Because when you are at war, in order to bring about a ceasefire, when you are at war, in order to bring about a ceasefire, it becomes necessary for the leaders, the generals of the two army. It becomes necessary for the generals of the two armies to sit down and have a ceasefire. I want y'all to understand something. For the leader of the Ku Klux Klan to request a meeting with Garvey, what is that telling you? I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to ask you again. The, the, the African guards of Garvey, the Universal African Legion is at war with the KKK defending the lives of black people. The leader of the KKK requests to meet with the most honorable Marcus Garvey. What is that telling you? Who's thinking out there? Who's thinking out there? You know why he wanted to meet with Garvey? Because he was shook. He was shook. He respected him and he respected his military power. Garvey had the power. Garvey had the power. And so the leader of the whites sat down with the leader of the blacks and said, listen, we never going to get along. We never going to like each other. We're going to continue to disagree. But if you want to save your clansmen, they better stop messing with our people. But as long as they threaten us, we are going to threaten them. And Marcus Garvey said he left that meeting and he said, hey, I was talking to a man who was unapologetically white and he was talking to a man who was unapologetically black and we left it at that. It was a ceasefire. That's all it was. Two generals engaged in war sitting down to call a Ceasefire to save lives. That was it. Garvey was the real rider die. Garvey was the real Rough Riders. The original Rough Riders is the African Guards of Garvey. The original Rough Riders is the Universal African Legion. And guess what, black women? KKK ain't want that smoke. They didn't want that smoke. They didn't want it. Them boys wasn't playing with them. You got to remember... Black men had just come back from the war. Black men had just come back from the war and had to deal with racism after they just got finished fighting. They said, we're not going through this. They started joining Garvey in droves. They, the St. Louis riots happened on Garvey. Tulsa happened on Garvey. Tulsa race war. Rosewood. Those black men said, we are going to join Garvey and we're going to fight to defend our women and children. And they joined the Universal African Legion. That's right. They strapped up, brothers and sisters. Wasn't no nonviolence in Garvey. Wasn't no nonviolence in Garvey. They strapped up. They didn't just show up to be seen by the news. They didn't just show up with a whole bunch of guns and do nothing. No, they showed up and they went to war to defend the black community. That's what Garvey is. That's what Garvey is. The deacons of defense was inspired by the Universal African Legion in the southern states. Yes. The Black Panther Party, inspired by the African Guards of Garvey, we were the first military. We were the first military and we carried guns. The African Legionnaires carried guns, real ones. It was the pull-up team, for real. It was the pull-up team. They had shootouts with the cops and everything. Do your history if you don't believe do you, you said I talk too much? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you off the live since I talk too much. Uh, course in knowledge. Should I block you, bro? It looked like you were elder. I think I see a, a great beard. I'm going to let you live for now, elder. Please watch your comments, sir. Please. I would hate to put an elder on the book of Negroes. 
Now, there's something else I want to say. And for those of you who want to take my course in Pan-Africanism, I teach a course, Revolutionary Pan-African Nationalism. I see some of my students online now. If any of y'all want to teach the course, it's a whole year. It's a whole year. And it's not just Garveyism. It's all the Pan-Africanists, all of them. See, I need you guys to understand something. I need you guys to understand something. The reason Garvey was so successful in America, whereas he could not have done it in Jamaica, I told you one was the color hierarchy in the islands, but another reason is because the foundation for Pan-Africanism had already been laid in America because Pan-Africanism was birthed in America. Let me say that again. The reason Garvey succeeded here but couldn't succeed in Jamaica is because the foundation for Pan-Africanism had already been laid for him in America. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Bishop Turner of the AME Church, the first black man to say God was black, an elected official in Georgia during Reconstruction, the first black chaplain in the Civil War, Bishop Turner, grandfather of Pan-Africanism, had just died. Before Garvey got to America, Booker T, another Pan-Africanist, had just died before Marcus Garvey had came. Martin Delaney, who came up with the phrase Africa for the Africans, Martin Delaney of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, where I went to high school at, laid the foundation for Garvey. Alexander Crummel, who's buried in New York, operated in New York, he laid the foundation for Garvey. Henry Highland Garnett laid the foundation for Garvey. Garvey already had the foundation laid. Marcus Garvey is to Pan-Africanism what Michael Jordan is to basketball. And we know Michael Jordan is a coon. Okay, so I'm not giving him no praise. I'm just drawing a parallel. Michael Jordan is a coon. Unless he gives me an FDMG donation, I might take the coon label off. But anyway. Marcus Garvey does for Pan-Africanism what Michael Jordan does for basketball. Michael Jordan isn't the first person to dunk a ball. Michael Jordan isn't the first person to dribble a ball. Michael Jordan wasn't the first person to play basketball. Michael Jordan wasn't the first per person to win an NBA championship or scoring title. He was not the first. He was not the first. He was not the first, but he was the best. Marcus Garvey wasn't the first Pan-Africanist. Marcus Garvey isn't the first one to take people to Africa. Marcus Garvey isn't the first one to get some ships. Marcus Garvey isn't the first one to teach black pride. Marcus Garvey isn't the first one to say Africa for the Africans. But Marcus Garvey was able to organize and build a platform and program for Pan-Africanism unlike any Pan-Africanist before him or after him. Garvey was able to do for Pan-Africanism what no Pan-Africanist could do before Garvey or after Garvey. How is Michael Jordan the coon? I'm not even going to waste my breath. That question is as ridiculous as the question Lord Jamal asked when he said why Marcus Garvey never went to Africa. That is a very stupid ass question for anybody with some common sense and a little bit of knowledge. So Garvey gets acquitted by the president of the United States. His sentence is commuted. Here's what I need y'all to know. And then we want to wrap this up with a couple Garvey quotes. Here's what I need y'all to know. Did y'all know that Calvin Coolidge, the president of the United States, who had African blood himself, Calvin Coolidge was another one of those Negro presidents, by the way. Calvin Coolidge was another one of those Negro presidents, by the way. When Calvin Coolidge signed Garvey's commutation of prison sentence and they let Garvey go, the Honorable Marcus Garvey was not told that Calvin Coolidge did not require his deportation back to Jamaica. Did y'all hear what I just said? Did anybody hear what I just said? Did anybody hear what Dr. Umar just said? I'm going to say it again. 
Calvin Coolidge, when he signed Garvey's commutation order, he did not require that Marcus Garvey be deported back to Jamaica. But nobody told Marcus Garvey. So when Marcus Garvey is released from prison in Atlanta, he is automatically taken to the port of New Orleans, Louisiana. Garvey went from Atlanta to the port of New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans, Louisiana. And on December the 2nd of 1927. On December the 2nd, of 1927, which was the saddest day in America for Garveyites and Pan-Africanists. December the 2nd, 1927, Garvey was put on a ship for Jamaica. And he left America for the last time, December the 2nd of 1927. And the Garveyites all showed up, tears in their eyes, that their leader, who had built in America in only 10 years, the largest black organization the world had ever seen. And as the ship left New Orleans on December the 2nd, of 1927, the Garveyites begin to sing one of the songs of the Garvey movement, which is called God Bless Our President. And they stood there on that rainy day in New Orleans, Louisiana, a state that had more Garvey divisions than any other state in America. And they stood there until they can no longer see the most honorable Marcus Garvey. Garvey doesn't find out until he's in Jamaica that Calvin Coolidge, the president of the United States, never required that he be deported from Jamaica. That's not the end of Garvey, though. We still have to deal with his second Jamaican period, and we have to deal with his final London period. But let me say this. Garvey leaves America on December the 2nd, 1927, at the age of 40 years old. Could you imagine between your 30th birthday and your 40th birthday, between your 30th birthday and your 40th birthday, you build the largest black organization in the world. You create the ideological foundation for the destruction of colonialism in Africa. You give birth to the very same minds that will ultimately liberate Africa from colonialism. You start the most revolutionary economic program in modern history, the Black Star Line Steamship and Distribution Network, and you do this between your 30th birthday and your 40th birthday. Well, although Marcus Garvey left America December 2nd, 1927, Garveyism didn't leave. There was a member of the UNIA. He served in the Detroit Universal African Legion. He served in the Chicago Universal African Legion. His name was Elijah Poole. Two and a half years after Marcus Garvey is deported from the United States of America, Elijah Poole meets Master Farad Muhammad. And these men give birth to the nation of Islam. The first meetings, some of the earliest meetings of the new organization was held inside of Marcus Garvey's Liberty Halls in Jamaica, excuse me, in Detroit. This is documented facts. Mr. Poole, who would become the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, would borrow all of Marcus Garvey's economic, self-determination, and race uplift programs. It would become the foundation for the new organization. 
The Honorable Elijah Muhammad would use one of Marcus Garvey's most famous quotes, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. And this Marcus Garvey quote will be plastered all over Detroit by the Honorable Marcus Garvey, serving as a sign to those who follow Garvey who can now come and follow him. Some of the earliest members of the new organization were former members of Marcus Garvey's UNIA. In fact, Mr. Muhammad would borrow the entire structure of Marcus Garvey's UNIA. As Marcus Garvey's had the Universal African Legion in the African Guards of Garvey, they would, that would be called the Fruit of Islam. As Marcus Garvey had the Black Cross nurses, whose job was to keep the African community and family safe and healthy and look after their health care and teach the young women how to be women and the women how to be women, that will become the Muslim Girls Training Program, the MGT. Marcus Garvey had divisions. Mr. Muhammad would have mosque. And so Mr. Muhammad, to his credit, by the way, brothers and sisters, I have total support for the Nation of Islam. I have total support for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his works, total respect for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, nothing but love for the Nation of Islam. I'm simply stating a historical fact that a member of the Garvey movement gave birth to that organization, that that organization borrowed extensively from Garvey's program, and that that organization was patterned after Garvey's organization. But they were not alone. Carlos Cooks started the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement. Later on, we get the new Black Panther Party. Dr. King himself spoke of his influence of Garvey. The greatest, one of the greatest organizers in the history of the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, was a child of the Garvey Movement raised by his parents who were officers in the Garvey Movement. And it doesn't stop there. Let's go to Europe. Ho Chi Minh, who was the liberator of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, who led Vietnam to their independence, got special permission to attend UNIA meetings while he was in New York City. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Not only the black leaders, but the white leaders studied and borrowed from Marcus Garvey. Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh attended Garvey meetings in New York and Ho Chi Minh took Garveyism to Vietnam and led Vietnam to independence. I'm not done. Mao Zedong, the man who gave birth to the People's Republic of China. Mao Zedong, the man who gave birth to the People's Republic of China studied Marcus Garvey and used Garveyism to rebuild China. I'm not going to stop there. Mussolini, the dictator of Italy who tried to invade Ethiopia, stole all of Marcus Garvey's ideas, but he used it for white supremacy. Adolf Hitler studied Marcus Garvey. In fact, Marcus Garvey sent Mussolini a telegram telling him that he had stole Garveyism and was now using Garveyism to try to take over the world. Everybody copied Marcus Garvey, not just the black leaders, the white leaders, the Chinese leaders, the, the, the Vietnamese leaders. Garvey was everything at that time, brothers and sisters. But here's what I love about Garvey. Here's what I love about Garvey. Here's what I love about Garvey. As great as he was, as powerful as he was, Marcus Garvey never claimed to be a prophet. He never claimed to be a messiah. Marcus Garvey said, I am nothing but a man who has come here to try to help my people. The Garvey movement was not a dictatorship. 